Hello plant lovers, it is Matthew in Melbourne welcoming you back to my channel. Thank you very much for finding me. And if you're new here, I grow cold, cool, intermediate orchids here in Melbourne, Australia, without a greenhouse or grow lights or humidifiers or any equipment, just me and them indoors or outdoors or not at all. So plant lovers, if that sounds like the type of setup you have, do hit subscribe. I post every week on a Friday. My ramblings are very amateurish. It is merely the way that I found to make things grow successfully for me in my climate. Not necessarily the best way, the right way, the only way, just what I figured out works for me. And today, plant lovers, hmm, more cymbidiums I hear you cry. Well, a viewer asked me, uh, following another cymbidium video of mine, to go through how to repot seedling cymbidiums. And I thought, well, there you go, why not? Just so happens, I have a couple. And just so happens, it's spring here in Australia, and that is the time to repot them. So why not dive in with a how to pot your seedling cymbidium video 101. And although it is actually quite late spring here in Australia, here is a cymbidium which is just sort of opening for me. And this is really just a segue. Curiously, I went to the closing down sale of a, of a grower here in Victoria. It's always sad when people close down. I get it, but I always just think, you know, it's shrinking the knowledge pool and the availability pool, but anyway. And there was this little cymbidium plant and it had a spike and the buds were still really tight so you couldn't see the color. But I thought, hmm, that's an established plant and it's quite a small, one of the smaller scale of cymbidiums. So I just thought, ah, oh, maybe it's going to have a sort of a quirky, charming flower. And as you can see, they haven't fully opened yet, but they're sort of more of that browny green with a little bit of maroon through them. Mm, interesting, but I kind of like its compact size. So we'll have to decide if that stays in the family. I think it will though, Cymbidiums are so low maintenance. Which brings us cunningly to the topic of today's film, which is repotting seedling cymbidiums. So let's begin. First of all, you need a seedling cymbidium. Now, the ones I've got are from a grower here in Melbourne and it's a place called Collector's Corner and I'll put the link below. They have a lot of cymbidiums seasonally. So they tend to have most of them obviously in sort of late winter, spring, when they're all in bloom. And they have the most amazing collection. And the great thing that they do actually is that they have a mature plant in bloom and underneath it they have seedlings of it with a picture but you can actually see the plant in flower you can get a sense of the scale of the plant whether it's going to be a more compact pendulous type of plant or one of the larger more erect type of plants or something in between so it's kind of a brilliant way to choose your cymbidium seedling and I had kind of vowed I do not need more cymbidiums, but I happened to be at Collector's Corner a few months ago, and while they were all in mid-bloom, their amazing cymbidium collection, and I did see a few, and I thought, oh, I just don't think I can live without them. So here they are. So it's kind of perfect timing that a viewer has asked to see um, a seedling repotting video because it's kind of the time. So let's contextualize the growing cycle of your cymbidium. So these are all hybrids. This particular one is called uh, love the moon, Tony's choice. Hmm. Don't necessarily love that name. And this one is called Mary Green Valencia, as you say in Spanish, or Valencia, if you don't want to say it in Spanish. This one, unfortunately, doesn't have a picture, but the color was quite extraordinary. This is a compact grower with a pendulous flowering habit. So there you go. Now, these were both $15 Australian. Not bad, not bad. You can get seedling cymbidiums in sort of plastic tubes in hardware stores here in Australia for around $10. So a little bit smaller, a little bit less advanced and perhaps not quite as healthy, but. So these two seedlings actually show us something quite interesting. So here we have seedling number one and this is its first year of growth. Well, it's kind of first year of adult growth, let's say, because it might actually be the second year that it's emerged. But anyway, so what we have is we have a single baby pseudobulb and we have all this beautiful green foliage. So that is basically what you'd be looking at for a first year of growth. And when you're buying seedlings, a few simple rules really, is the foliage nice and healthy and is the seedling firm in the pot? If it's rocking, you know, the root system might not be that healthy. There might be an issue with it. So just try and find one that's quite firm in the pot and that's as lush as possible and you're kind of good to go. 
Now this one, although we still have our first year of growth, so we have our little baby pseudobulb and our lovely luscious form, um, remember that this one is a compact grower with pendulous flowers and this one is a slightly bigger plant ultimately in its growing habits. So you can see they're quite at different stages and you might think, hmm, this one's you know weaker, smaller, and this one's bigger, more vigorous, but they essentially have different growth habits. So that's a, a good point to bear in mind if you're kind of comparing apples and lemons with the size of your cymbidium seedling. But this one, as you can see, this one has already got its second year growth. So this is what happens with cymbidiums. Year one, you get your first pseudobulb and your first amount of growth. Then in spring, and this is the cycle where it happens, the following spring, you will then get your first shoot. And this is the beginning of the plant starting to bulk itself up. Now, at this point, you're probably gonna get one shoot a year until maybe year three, and then you might start to get two growths a year, and then the growth of the plant gets exponential. And in terms of flowering, you're probably looking at year three to four. So it's a bit of a commitment from a time management perspective, but still, $15, and also when you really know what flower and plant you're getting, not a bad way, and really, three years passes like that. So when is the best time to repot them? Now, several schools of thought, essentially, Cymbidiums are fairly vigorous growers and they have quite vigorous root systems. Um, and when we go to repot these, I'll actually show you the roots. You can't see any of them poking out the bottom, but they're quite vigorous growers. Now, I would actually be tempted if I were buying a seedling like this that shows no obvious signs of being pot bound. You can't see the roots coming out. You can't see them clawing at the top. The plant's healthy, it's quite stable. It's in fresh medium. You know it's only about a year old because of the size of the plant. I would actually be tempted just to leave it as it is until perhaps year two, when you start to get secondary growth. That then might be the time to repot it. But even then, I would say only on a needs basis. Again, if the roots are really starting to, to poke out um, or the medium is looking a bit tired, then maybe that would be the time to repot it. So, one of the first questions is, well, do you really need to repot it? And I would say, Actually, no. If it's healthily presented in a setting like this, so it's got good mix, reasonable size pot, it's showing no signs of, of sort of discomfort, then I would perhaps just leave them as they are. So have an area where your seedlings are growing and just leave them to do their thing for a couple of years. Of course, some of us though have a stronger aesthetic streak or perhaps we just repot everything as it arrives. Now, this is a seedling that I repotted last year. So it was the same size as this, the same kind of setup. And as you can see, we have our first year of growth here. And then this year, I had my second year of growth, which is quite advanced already. And this one is called Vida or Vida Harlequin, quite a beautiful flower. Now, so here's another Matthew Amateur potted theory about potting cymbidiums. As we know, they are vigorous growers, so they develop really chunky, thick root systems, uh, which can be a problem in terms of repotting them, particularly in terracotta, because the roots can stick and it's hard to get them out. Hmm. This is kind of one advantage of plastic, but anyway. But the other thing is that cymbidiums do like to be really verging on the totally pot bound. They like a really constricted root system. So what you shouldn't really be doing is over potting a cymbidium with all of this kind of negative space around the pseudobulb because it doesn't really thrive in that environment. However, just to complicate issues, you're not gonna get any blooms from a, a plant this size for three or four years. So that's three or four years of quite vigorous growth. And by about year two, three, you're gonna start getting multiple growth points on your plant, which means two, three, four pseudobulbs, which means obviously equally vigorous root system. So I would say by year three, four, your seedling, even though at the moment it looks over potted, by year three, four, it's actually gonna be perfect for this pot and ready to flower. And I have got some um, seedlings that I potted in a pot about this size, which followed that trajectory and they flowered in sort of year three. So 
the cymbidiums need to be in a small pot and pot bound message is true, but at this point, we're not really worried about them flowering. It's really about stimulating their root growth, which will then stimulate their new pseudobulb growth, which will make the plant bigger, more vigorous, and enable it to bloom in a speedy manner. So that's kind of one of the odd caveats, I think, around repotting cymbidiums. Now, when you've got a more mature plant, and I've made repotting videos, which I'll link of cymbidiums, that is when you don't really pot up because the plant needs to be as root bound as is possible without kind of being unpleasant <laughs> for everyone involved. So when you are potting up a mature cymbidium, you would only go up one pot size and just create an extra small amount of new medium around the root. So yeah, it does appear a contradiction in terms at the moment that we're putting these seedlings in such large pots. But it's all a matter of taste, isn't it? So these are the pots I'm using, that's the size. So this one's 12 centimeters, which is about four inches. Uh, and this one is roughly the same. You know, it doesn't really matter. You don't need to be particularly hung up about what size it is. Just something that's gonna give your plant three or four years of root growth before you have to repot it again. Because repotting cymbidiums can be a bit of a trial because they are beasts when they get going. So we should really get on to repotting them and I'll go through the process with you. But first, mm, look at this tray of deliciousness. Now. Here's another little segue about the quirks of me. And again, this is just something I do. I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. It's totally up to you. But this is a ton of old potting medium from orchids of mine that didn't make it. Now, it's generally not a great idea to reuse potting material from orchids for various reasons, obviously including fungal problems and other illnesses and sicknesses that might be in the medium, or it might just be old and tired. However, if you've just repotted something and it immediately dies, not because of a virus, whatever, just, but just because of your poor orchid care, then why waste all that material essentially? And if it's in good condition and you know there's nothing compromising it. So I've got a kind of a big tub, unfortunately, it is quite big and quite full of potting medium from orchids that just didn't make it. So with my cymbidiums, because I'm a little bit hands off, I'm recycling potting medium. And the other thing I'm using is out of the bag orchid mix. And this comes from a chain store, hardware store here in Australia called Bunnings. There's a big bag and it says orchid potting mix. And I would imagine wherever you are in the world, whether you're in Europe or Britain or North America, wherever you're gonna find a similar out of the bag potting mix. And this one is sort of a mix of bark and coconut husk, um, but it's a little bit grittier. So it almost feels as though there's a little bit of regular potting mix. So it's just a little bit denser than just bark. And I find that cymbidiums just love it. Out of the bag, easy to find, cheap. And talking of the material that they're in, always good to remember where cymbidiums come from. So the ones we're talking about are all hybrid cymbidiums. So these have been hybridized for generations to produce either particular flower type, particular habit of growing, color, sometimes fragrance, etc., etc. Now there are of course uh, tropical cymbidiums and tropical hybrid cymbidiums, which is fantastic for those of you in tropical areas that love cymbidiums. And in fact, the native Australian cymbidiums are from the far north of the country, which means they're tropical, so I can't grow them. Anyway, most of these hybrids that we're looking at are hybridized from uh, Himalayan Chinese species cymbidiums, so they are cool growers. But the other thing that they are generally all are is that they're epiphytes, but not the type of epiphyte that sort of clings to the side of a trunk of a tree, like say a Phalaenopsis would, so it's got those aerial roots and it really sticks and not much medium around it. Cymbidiums tend to be growing more sort of in nooks and crevices, uh, either in branches or around the base of a tree. So this is where medium has sort of gathered in a, in a little nook and the uh, cymbidium has taken root in that nook. So this is one of the reasons they like to be pot bound. They come from quite a constrained space. So if you imagine that contained space, it's just gonna be full of detritus and things that have kind of collected in it. Bits of organic material, leaves, bark, twigs, etc., etc. all those things that are sort of composting, but in a fairly small area and the plant is working its way through it. So that's one of the reasons I use out of the bag mix because it's just pretty generic. It's a bit gritty. It's got a bit of bark in it, but it's not super aerated. It's kind of got a bit more going on and all my cymbidiums seem to love it. I also use that out of the bag mix for all my aroids as well and all my Australian native orchids. Anyway, let's turn the camera around and begin our repotting epic.
Okay, plant lovers, so let's just recap what we need. We have got some tags and pencils just for labeling our new plants. We have got our pots, obviously. We have got slow release general fertilizer. Now, as you can see here, this one says six months of feeding. Now, I would suggest always go for six month um, slow release general fertilizer for orchids. So you can get a slow release fertilizer for 12 months, which would be great for sort of a garden context or maybe other pot plants, but you sort of don't wanna be feeding orchids in late autumn and winter, which would be obviously the other half of the six months. So I think just keep your eye on the fact that you're generally gonna be looking for six months for your slow release fertilizer. And then of course, mycorrhizal fungi. You know, I live for mycorrhizal fungi apologies for the terrible packet. Um, the mycorrhizal fungi develops a symbiotic relationship with the roots of the plant and enables the roots to extract all the nutrients it needs from the potting medium. So very important. There is probably already mycorrhizal in the mix. Doesn't hurt to add more and it won't damage the plant at all. And I'll put the link to that below. So let us have a look at our seedling. So this was the first one we looked at. Um, this one is called Love the moon, Tony's choice. So a cascading orchid, but a slightly mm, a sort of more vigorous and larger plant. So these sort of cascading types of cymbidiums do really well in hanging baskets. So that's another thing to bear in mind. You might want to sort of grow it on in pot culture until it's maybe year three, four, and then you would put it in a hanging basket, which is its sort of final home. If you were doing that as well, I would probably say, heaven help me, that it's a good idea to continue using plastic because it is easier to manage. But you know, I'm a terracotta pot kind of guy. Let us have a look at what this one is looking like and we can see what its root system is like. Oh, well actually, how interesting that we've unpotted this one because here's me assuming the best, but look, we've actually got some squishy dead roots. Oh dear me. Well, plant lovers, there's a revelation. This is like the cliffhanger in Dynasty. <gasps> Who shot JR? Why are the roots rotting? Hmm. Well, I am now, which I didn't think I'd need, just gonna go and get some scissors and just trim off some of these damaged roots. So I've got my sterilized, fabulous Chinese scissors. You can use rubbing alcohol or you can heat them. Just because these roots are a little bit, um, well, damaged, I'm really keen to make sure I clean these scissors after I've used them. So that's one root. These roots are goners, goodness me. This isn't looking good, is it? So the good news is, as you can see, we've got really active, healthy root tips here. Well, this one is gonna be an interesting case in point, so <laughs> we'll just have to see how well it does. Okay, so new pot, and we'll just put some of that medium in the bottom, like this, then a mix of the uh, the out of the bag mix, which is fresh and new with some of the older one. We are going to put in here our slow release fertilizer. There we go. We'll put a little bit of um, mycorrhizal fungi, which I feel might be very beneficial in this case, as we need to really support root growth. And then we are potting our plants. There we go. Now, given we just had to remove probably 50% of the root material, I am actually going to stake this one just to give it something to lean on in the meantime so that it doesn't flop in the pot. There we go, there is number one. Okay, so this one is Mary Green, Balenthia. All right, let's hope we've had a better result with this one. Ah, yes, look at that. Already my heart is relieved. Look, so that's the kind of root system that you would kind of hope for and expect from a healthy seedling. Um, look at that, look at that lovely sort of um, beigey color and lots of them. So you can see none of that sort of brown color, none of those squishy dead bits as we saw in the other one. Mm. So actually, thank you to my viewer for asking me to make this video because I would never I've realized that this one had such terrible roots, I would have left it for a year. Now there is just a little bit of old root matter in the middle there, which I will just trim out. 
So there you go. So you can see how that root system is going to really stabilize the plant. And then you can also see quite clearly where that new growth is coming from, sort of the base of year one pseudobulb. This is year two pseudobulb. And then from this pseudobulb next year, you might get another growth, possibly two if you were lucky, and then on and on. So the plant will grow very quickly. But there you have a really good example of a uh, seedling symbidium root system. So we get our pot, we put in our base medium, we put in our slow release fertilizer, we put in our mycorrhizal fungi, we get our roots in and you sort of want the, the height of the plant to be roughly where it was before. So don't bury it too deeply or expose it too much. And then in we fill and as we kind of have sort of a cage with these roots, just making sure that we get medium into that sort of underneath bit. So there we are, that's all good. Putting our label back in, I'm gonna keep this label as it's fine, there we are. And so now I'll just go and give them both a good watering. So here is our seaweed based tonic and this is a tonic, not a fertilizer, which I will now dilute. A healthy splosh, dilute, decant, and then just give them a really, really good drenching. So we want all of that sphagnum to be absorbing water. Now I normally wouldn't use sphagnum moss in cymbidium uh, potting, but as I said, I'm just sort of recycling some old potting mix and so it happens to have a bit of sphagnum in it. There we go, well watered. Well, there we are plant lovers, one potted healthy cymbidium and one potted perhaps not, well, hmm, root challenge, let's just say. So many thanks to my viewer for prompting me to make this video because I wouldn't have unpotted this one and found out that half its roots were dead. Hmm, interesting. Why could that have happened? Million dollar question. It could have just been too wet. Cymbidiums do like to be on the drier side. I'm pretty sanguine about cymbidiums. They're really tough and they do have very vigorous root growth when they get going. So it did have new and viable roots. So hopefully they're the ones that are gonna take action and take control. But you did see the difference in the size and the health of the root systems between these two seedlings. So interesting point to bear in mind, you can't really tell. I would have thought looking at that, the plant was healthy and it was stable in, um, in the seedling pot that it was in. This one, in fact, you might think, hmm, a bit skinnier, but it does have a new growth, which does suggest that it's happy in its year one stage and is happy to go into year two and start growing again. Anyway, interesting case in point, just to realize that not all seedlings are made the same. But there we are. I hope that was of some interest to you who are beginning your cymbidium growing journey if you're buying seedlings. They're very easy. Now all of mine are going to go outside again where the others are so they get dappled light. They get slightly stronger light in winter because the leaves are deciduous of the trees that they're underneath. But they're also sort of at the edge of the carport so they don't get rained on uh, so I can control the watering. Another great idea is to tip a pot upside down so that you're standing them on that and you elevate them a little bit. Cymbidium's light like that because what they don't like is squishy roots and being over damp which might actually have been the problem with this one. So free draining mix, slightly elevated, great way to go. Dappled light, they do like a cool winter to stimulate their flowering when they're mature um, but I've made some bidium videos which I'll link. I've also made a grow space video which I'll link which shows you where I grow all my cymbidiums. So there we go, out these will go with their friends and cousins, their species ancestors and their hybrid relatives outside to fend for themselves and see how they go. This one I am very confident of as it's got a new growth. Tony's choice, hmm, will it make it? We shall see, cliffhanger. Anyway, plant lovers, thank you very much for watching. I do post every week on a Friday, so hit subscribe if you want to know what my next continuing amateur orchid adventure will be. But until then, from the seedlings and me, see you next week.